so my name is Jari Hokkanen and I work at the Turku Game Tech and Arts Lab to assistant, student assistant and I study at the Turku University of Applied Sciences to become media producer. Yep, and hello everyone. I'm Vesa Nieminen. I also work at the Turku Game Tech and Arts Lab and I study at the University of Turku. Uh, my major is computer science. So, let's start. Yeah, that was just to give you a bit of an uh, introduction what, uh, to what Game Tech and Arts Lab is about in Turku. So back to presentation then. Uh, so uh, Turku Game Tech and Arts is a joint game development project between Turku University and Turku University of Applied Sea Sciences. Uh, our goal is to, is to have curriculums in both our schools and we aim to uh, bring together technology, art and design to the students early on. Uh, uh, our project is funded by Technologia and Satavuotissäätiö and uh, with that we have uh, uh, getting uh, ourselves at the uh, uh, game development lab with uh, various hardwares and softwares to develop big and small games. Uh, we also have a demo room for, for a little de uh, game researching and a, g a little game museum there. Yeah, and the demo room has PS3, uh, Xbox 360, Wii and all sorts of games that you can test out. Uh, yeah. Please turn the lights back on, <laughs> because you might not see the, li the uh, slides here. So, uh, we offer also wide ranges, a range of courses, like uh, interactive storytelling, screenwriting, digital arts, game project courses, coding, uh, 3D arts, and uh, producing. And every autumn, uh, we have this professional game industry guest lecture series, uh, uh, where speakers come, companies like Remedy, Bugbear, Rovio, Sumea, etc., etc. Yeah, and these guest lectures, as you can uh, discern from this picture, is very widely popular. There's like well over 200 people in every lecture last autumn, and the place is like 450 people. Yeah. So it's like people are s sitting in the on the floor, and like not everyone even fits the room. Yeah. Uh, Dem was also talking there last year, so he can attest <laughs> to that. Yeah. Uh, so we have this autumn we do we have this guest lecture series. So welcome everybody. Yes, for free, free for everyone. Yeah. So let's move to Load. Uh, Load is our game development club in Turku. And the separation here is that Game Tech and Arts Lab provides the facili facilities, as Yari said, the, the courses and all that, all that other stuff. And then the club is the people themselves. Otherwise, the place would just be empty. And that's not very nice. So Load is the, uh, the club itself. There's a couple of people here from Load, so if you can actually raise your hand so you know, know those guys. They're not Game Tech and Arts Lab, but they're Load, as, as <laughs> yeah, are we. Yeah. Okay, so here's a typical day, how it looks to be in the Game Lab uh, with people. There's uh, some people coding, working on their projects, and also yeah. some artists on the back right picture with the Tomb Raider poster. Yeah, and it's like casual Friday every day with us, so nothing official. Yep. Yeah. And what... Uh, load is mainly about is the main focus is our mutual game projects. We want to make games together and around that thing we also have other well recreational activities like having like sauna or going to flow bark all this other stuff and uh, we do game jams together. This month we can do together with score just gonna get a couple of guys there to Tampere and work on games in a very short period of time and uh, then we have some dojos, art dojos, coding dojos where the idea is that we work around one computer and produce one piece of code, one piece of art, and swap the, the, the coder or the artist in that session. And what else? Well, we have uh, yeah, unofficial courses. That's another one. So for example, an art course that uh, some people have given us before. And here's a couple of p images. So on the top image, we have Ville and Mika. Uh, working on this uh, load rally game that we did in our, I think it was second or third game jam game. Uh, it was actually finished in three hours, this prototype. So the idea is to have like a server that runs on Macs, PCs or iPhones or iPods or iPads 
you can have any any of those as a server and then as a client. So you can like just using Unity's easy network interface, as the Kayak guys probably know, it's like just really, really easy plug and play system. So we did that game in three hours. And then next, uh, we have this uh, project called Downhill where Hoksu Yari is the project manager, producer, and designer. designer. Yeah. Uh, there's VP up top making some nice graphical effects in Unity. And then Nora doing some 2D art with the with a pad there. Uh, and so it's not only 3D that we do. Uh, then there's a very interesting bit of game design here going on with VB and Mikko. They designed this uh, board game system themselves to make an iPad strategy game. So what does a strategy board game have to do with an iPad game? Well, they want to test out the rule system before they actually code the game in hard code because it's hard to change. So they play it out and then test it and then put it into the, into, the, into the game itself in Unity. And then last but not least at all, there's the Funkenstein guys there. And they're working there in the lab, making the game. It was like taken, the first picture on top was taken, I think, two, three months ago. Yeah. Uh, working on the game and then, like I think the bottom most picture was uh, the last release before the actual assembly started like I think a couple of weeks before or before the first submit. Okay, so that's how it looks to be in the daily life of Float. So uh, you can get uh, more information about us on our webpage gametechanarts.fi and we have a building building at ECT House in Turku, room B B2040. B2040. Yeah. Easier to remember. <laughs> And check our, uh, check our website to yeah, get more information. We have a bo booth near the main entrance, so welcome to ask any questions about our activities or something. Yep. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Any questions or something? Or we can leave for later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Meanwhile, in Finland. Help. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Meanwhile, Tour could, could do a little dance here. <laughs> Today in the game development uh, competition ends at five o'clock, I believe, the voting. And uh, just vote what you think is the best game, of course. You can vote for three games. I voted for, well, I'm not going to tell you.
Okay, finally, we're back online. Anyway, hello everyone and greetings from Tampere. I'm Evi Korhonen, I'm representing uh, Tampere University of Applied Sciences, or TAMC, as almost everyone knows it. Well, I'm not here to talk about our school, even though it's very great and awesome, but I'm here to talk about a student uh, prototyping project we made this summer, and it's called 5D2. And what's it about? It's about making five games with five students in five weeks, working five hours a day and five days a week. Very sort of neurotic. So basically, it's about making fast games, so five quick and fast games. And this is not our original idea, as maybe some of you can tell from the name. It was actually first made by Temu here in the summer of 2008. And we were sort of thought that this is a good idea. We want to make it too. And basically, what's it like to make a game in 25 hours? It's quite daunting when you first go at it. And basically, our idea was that we make nothing beforehand. We come in on Monday, 9 o'clock, and we start making ideas that on that spot. We, well, you can prepare an idea, but you're not allowed to sort of you know, go very far into it. And then we have to quickly agree on some sort of game idea. And we start working, work uh, uh, five hours a day, depending on our schedule. And then on Friday, of course, we're all very busy. And then we have to finish everything by about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And then we put everything on the web, even though it's unfinished. So it's, it's sort of quite cruel, but you have to set yourself deadlines. So why did we make this? First of all, it's, it, it's a good project. Because if you make one big game, you're only going to learn from that game. But if you make five games, you're going to learn from all of those. So instead of putting your eggs in, in the same basket, you get five smaller baskets, and you can take lessons from each one. So when in the first game you screw up, you're going to say, like, OK, I screwed up. And then in the second game, you can improve on that area. And then in the second game, you screw up something else. And then you can make it better in the third game. So basically, the idea is to learn about the process of making games instead of making that cool game that is going to win over everyone in the internet. And of course, we can also say that, hey, I've made five games. And that's pretty cool, and game companies like that. So it's also to get experience and something to put in our resumes. And on the side, you can make fun games. But it's the, again, I have to stress that the point was not to make good games. You can make good games, and that's a bonus. But if you fail, it's as good as making a good game, because you can take away the lessons anyway. And here are the games we made. I don't have time to show them to you, but you can uh, see them on the web, and you can also come to our booth to play them. But I'll just uh, have a quick run through these. And on the top left there, we have uh, Elder Strolls Dungeons of Dementia, which was a 2D, uh, very simple role-playing game. And on the top right, there's Frankenstein, which was a steampunk-themed uh, puzzle game. And on the left middle was Poltergeist, our first game, which sort of shows if you play, play through it. It was sort of a clicking game with, where the point was to scare the victim to death. And on the right uh, bottom, uh, Hammered Fists of the Ninja, uh, which was a sort of very old 8-bit uh, style sort of climbing game where a drunken ninja, you try to get through to the tower and you're sort of drunk and hallucinations attack you on the way. And on the uh, right, uh, left bottom, uh, Rotating Robot Rumble, or Triple R, as we like to call it. It's a sort of destruction mayhem side-scrolling. We like the 8-bit style, if you can probably tell from there. And lessons, what we learned from this project. It's, these are very simple lessons, but uh, believe me that it's the simple lessons that are the hardest to learn. You think you know everything. But it's not until you've actually failed at something you really, really sort of internalize the lessons. And I'm just going to quickly go through what these mean for us. And first of all, game mechanics above all, of course. Because our team, we had two programmers, one artist, uh, one producer, one sound designer. We didn't have anyone who was sort of dedicated designer. And that sort of sometimes shows. And we started sometimes from a like, cool setting, like let's have a steampunk game or something like that. But it should start from always from the mechanics. What is fun? What is the idea of this game? What is the player going to do? And that is where you should start. At least, I think it's a very good point to start. 
and clear and consistent communication. Even though we were all working in the same lab, everyone, we have four PCs and one laptop, it's still not given that you're going to communicate with your team. You should uh, have the team, have them a sense that you're going to tell everyone what you're doing and show everyone what you're doing so that everyone is always on the same page. And another thing here is uh, me as the producer, I was sort of half-time producer, I changed into a sort of graphic artist assistant because in this sort of small production, uh, producer isn't that important, but it's still it's a good point to communicate what everyone is supposed to do. And we had a task wall. So basically, after the first project, I realized, OK, this is not working. So I put all of our tasks on little post-its, uh, attached them to the back wall. And everyone could see they're like, OK, I still have to do this, this, and this. And that was very good, because it was not on an Excel sheet hidden in the, somewhere in the deep, dark corners of the web. But it was still like, you could just you know, turn your back, and it would be there, very easy. And then we could communic communicate about the tasks. We could say, like, hey, I don't think that task is important, or we could drop that feature. So communication, cool. And then planning. Even though you have 25 hours, every minute you spend planning is worth it. And we noticed that time and time again, especially when our two programmers sat down and thought about the uh, coding structure. That was very, very good. And it saved us time in the end. So even though you think like, OK, I need to get started. I need to make this game now. You really should maybe sit down for a moment and think about what you're going to do before you do it. And also, when you're, when you're doing the project, also think about, do we still have time to do this? You ha might have to kill your darlings and take out features, because it's better to make something uh, that is finished instead of uh, putting out something that looks very cool but was unfinished. And then learn to walk before you blast your way through 15 levels of multiplayer mayhem. It's very hard sometimes to adapt to the idea that this is going to be a prototype, more of a vertical slice than a finished game. And that was also the hardest part for us because the ambition was high. And we had to sometimes adjust our expectations that we could not make the cool game that we all had in our minds. Instead, just show, show the world like this is what we sort of had in mind in the game instead of just you know, trying to make the whole game and screwing up everything. But you can also read about the whole development process. We blogged about it. And you can find the blog at this address. And we also have the postmortems for all of the games there. And what's going to happen with the project in the future? We liked some of the games so much that we're determined to make better versions of them. And you're going to probably see them this autumn. Uh, I don't have any timetable yet because we don't know what's going to happen with the school. But if you follow the blog or our, the SCORE website, you'll probably hear about it. And hopefully the new students will also get excited about this project and hopefully we'll have a 5D3 next summer. And if you have any questions, we might have some time to take them now. Or you can also afterwards. Okay, we'll. You can come ask afterwards, or you can come to the booth. We have all the games there. And you can also find them at this website. They're all on browser. So feel free to play them and give us feedback. Thanks. Bye. Okay, hi everyone, good morning, and I'm pleased to see you. So many here to listen to our presentations about game education in Finland. So, my name is Sveli Pekka Piirainen, and I am a lecturer in the game programming side in our university, and I'm also head of our Kayak Game Development Lab and uh, project manager in our game education and game engine technology development project. So, proudly we can say we are number one in Finland in game education. We started in uh, 2006 uh, to educate game programmers and uh, since last autumn we have a new extensive curriculum for digital games. So, our students can choose what they would like to be producers, game designers, artists or programmers. So they can have a specialization 
for those areas. And the uh, most important thing is that our students make development teams at the very beginning and start to make games. And every team has uh, at least uh, one producer, one game designer, and then one, two, one, two or three uh, graphics guys, and uh, one, two, three uh, programmers, depending on the size of the development projects. And uh, our development process model uh, is like in the games industry, that everything starts with generating ideas and uh, making some kind of uh, pre-planning, uh, brief game design document, analysis about the market, is it worth of doing this kind of game, where would you like to sell it, how, and so on. And uh, student teams make pitching to us, so te to teachers, and we will approve the game idea that should they start to make the pre-production or not. So if they get the green light, they can, they can uh, have the pre-production phase, and uh, after that they have also a big pitching again, and then they can move to the production and publication. So idea is that the students could publish their games uh, really uh, and get some money about selling those games. So yes, uh, how the studies are uh, commonly. So studies last about three and a half years and the first half year is uh, basic studying and one important tool is the Imaging Cup. So students when they come to our school they have to start to make a game for Imaging Cup development, uh, uh, game development competition. And uh, after half a year, uh, they will choose would they like to study game development or not. Because the first half a year is uh, general studies for everyone studying uh, uh, computer science. And about half of the students can continue to study games. So that is some kind of uh, validif validification, qualification process during the first four months. And after that, students then work in teams practically three years making games all the time. And we also have uh, courses, of course, but they are integrated with the game development process that they are not separate courses and separate game development. So they are integrated together so that the courses, students will have support the game, game development. And uh, one important thing we have is the Kayak Games Cooperation. It's a company that our students have founded last uh, February. So the students, when they make the games, they will make it professionally because they have own company and they can get money making games. So it will motivate a lot. And uh, we can say that relation between theory and practice about is about 20% to 80%. So our students learn when they are making games, not sitting in the classroom and uh, listening to each. So, roughly we can say that uh, our students have two days a week uh, studying and three days a week making games in their teams. Here's a picture of our classroom. So, interesting point is that uh, all our students are in the same classroom although they are artists or programmers or producers or game designers. And uh, if there's a, a lesson for programmers, uh, artists can also listen it, but they can also make own work at the same time. And we have divided it so that the artists are in the 
same table group and programmers are in own table groups and so on. And uh, so they don't disturb so much each other during the lesson. But when they are making the game development in teams, they are also near to each other. So I see the biggest problem in another universities is that there's a uh, art department in another building and another building there's computer science department and those people don't meet each other so often but in our school they are living in the same classroom let's say eight hours per day five days per week and uh, it's also so strict that students have to come eight o'clock in the morning to the classroom and they can leave four o'clock in the afternoon. So they are, have to be there. They cannot go and come when they want. So we also have our own game engine we have developed. So it's a multi-platform game engine but it's uh, targeted especially for the smartphones like iPhone and Nokia phones and uh, Windows phone. But they also upscale very well to the PC and consoles. So we have also PC, Linux and, and uh, Windows versions. And here are some student games they have done. Simple 2D games or 3D games for different kind of uh, mobile platforms mostly. some pictures and I also have a little video about one multiplayer game made with our uh, with our game engine and there's also some AI AI in that game the little Dutch are the rally cars going around. And of course you can see more our games at our booth. The newest ones, 7-bit Pirates game, you can vote it. And also some uh, iPhone and, uh, and Nokia games for Nokia N900. Okay. Time is almost up. So, thank you very much. We take questions after our panel discussion. We have about 15 minutes left. Uh, and uh, Teemu Haila will be the leader of the panel discussion, ask some tricky questions. And we will discuss about the cooperation uh, and, uh, and student companies and uh, student game clubs in Tampere, Turku and Kajani. Thank you very much. So yeah, hello everyone. I'm Teemu Haila. I've been referred to a few times here. Uh, just to give you a quick background, um, I graduated from the TAMK uh, School of Art and Media and uh, I was the founder of the Finland's first game development club SCORE currently in Tampere area. We have a cool booth down there, or they have, I'm not, not, no longer affiliated, of course. And I will be leading this uh, panel discussion, and we will take some uh, questions later on, and I hope we can uh, continue our discussion afterwards. But right now, I want to touch on some of the topics we missed, uh, particularly. Uh, Velipekka, you mentioned that we have this thing called Osuskunta around. We have student companies inside the schools. This is pretty new. I mean, this is something that's come up just this year. Uh, how does this company affect the uh, students in your school? Uh, most important point is that uh, students uh, have a different kind of motivation to make games because they know that uh, 
when they make good games, they can sell them and they can get money. So, in fact, the uh, guys in your school developed games and published them to some platforms, or? Yeah, that is the main point. That's kind of cool. Also, in Tampere and Turku, there are different kind of companies based around the same model. Could you tell us briefly on the actions that we're doing? Well, um, the score has also its own co-op, the Osuskunta. It's called High Score. It's still quite new, but they're planning to follow the sort of same model, so that the score is for the sort of younger students who are still maybe unsure if they want to get into games, and then when they sort of graduate, then they realize like I want to do this for a living. Then they may join the High Score, and there they actually work work and make games and it's sort of meant to be their first company and if they sort of if they manage to do something that really works they can spin off their own company of that but it's meant to be sort of safe place to start in in the terrible world of company life yeah and Turku we also share that idea uh, we're not at that stage yet that we have a cooperative company there organization but we're definitely like here heading that way and learning from you guys as much as we can. And the idea for us is to have a channel of distribution where, where students, when they work in a project in school, they can choose if they want to, to publish the game. So we have the licenses needed and the channel to do that. So all the, like, uh, uh, all the things that you need to have for that. OK. Uh, what kind of uh, channels of distribution are you targeting? What kind of games are you? mainly seeing built around in your schools? Mainly they are games for uh, mobile devices like iPhone, so App Store is the main target, and also we are making now uh, 10 games for Windows Marketplace for the new Windows mm, Phone 7, and uh, then uh, Facebook. These are the three most important. And also we are uh, making the same games for the uh, iPhone, they will be also released for the uh, Ovisto in Nokia, Nokia Ovisto. Well, I think then you know more about this, but I, we're still sort of in the early stages too, but it's more, we have very strong uh, knowledge of Unity and XNA, so something probably along those lines will also reflect on the platforms we're going to publish on. But it's, of course, it's going to depend on what the students want to do. If there's a lot of people who want to publish on Facebook or something like that, of course, we would get the proper licenses. Yes, and uh, Unity is also the tool that we use in Turku mostly. Uh, some guys have been using XNA, but uh, I think the Unity games, well, PC, uh, Mac, and iPhone, iPad games are going to be the first ones. Cool. And how about the general reception, maybe uh, inside the companies themselves and outside the companies? Uh, have you gotten any feedback yet about are people interested? Uh, do you have any customer relationships yet, if you will, if you can start? Uh, of course, uh, uh, people are interested. So our students are interested in to get their own products on the market. Also. Game companies are interested to cooperate with us, and uh, one one good point is uh, that uh, there's no so every everybody is happy. Let's say <laughs> that there's a channel for the students to publish their games easily and practice uh, how to be an entrepreneur without any risk. That's the most important point. Okay. Yeah, in Tampere we also benefit that we're in very close cooperation with Demola. If people have heard of it, it's sort of open innovation platform where people, the students can uh, prototype stuff for real companies. So of course we've you know developed very close liaisons to that area. And uh, well, we haven't got a lot of uh, uh, involvement with the th companies in Tampere, but I think the idea is that the students could also sort of do uh, uh, sub 
subcontracting through the high score. So you wouldn't also, you know, you wouldn't have to work in a team. You could also use the high score as a sort of um, way to build a company. So it's sort of easier for the student. Making everything easier for the student, that's the sort of whole point. Yep, and Turgo shares that same point. We want to make it easy for the students, so billing is one thing. And uh, like the company relationships, we've start just uh, gotten our couple of first company, you could say, orders. So we have, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, we got basically a course based on company order of like test doing testing for a game. So they would the students would get credits for testing and also level design and then some work placement for the students in game companies so they would get to the work life as well. Yeah, well seeing that uh, all of us are sharing pretty much the same love on the ideals, uh, what kind of visions do you have on the cooperation of these different companies and maybe the clubs or schools as we can see them as single communities, what kind of cooperation uh, models or plans have you got in place? Like Vesa, you mentioned you're participating in the upcoming Game Jam in Tampere. And we had the Global Game Jam in January where we all had our own, um, own teams working around the Finland at the same time. Uh, anything else in mind? What are, what's the future plan? Yes, I think you mentioned the most important cooperation points that the Global Game Jam uh, was actually the first one we made. Assembly is of course the second one. I think next year we will be together also here. It's very nice to have a common booth for all of us. And of course we have to think that uh, maybe there's coming uh, another, another universities which will teach game education. So we will welcome them also to cooperate with us. And of course we can uh, uh, develop our education together because Finland is a small small country so maybe some kind of cooperation that uh, for example is if Tampere is good in some point they can teach our students and we can teach Tampere or Turku students in some cases something like that. Well, I feel that I, in this point I'm the wrong person talking because Temu made his thesis on this whole thing. But um, what I've learned that the sort of future plans would be that the sort of um, cooperatives and the game clubs would actually have a sort of network between them. So we could have a sort of shared communication and perhaps a marketing platform for the companies. For them, it would be easier to communicate with us, uh, maybe finding workforce. They wouldn't have to, you know, contact every club separately or every school separately they could post it on the sort of common portal or whatever it's gonna whatever form this platform is going to take but they could find the workforce easier and we could you know contact the companies that would have sort of more force behind us because we could say hey we are all the game clubs and cooperatives in Finland together yep it's about making the brand as demo discusses in the thesis brand for Finnish uh, game clubs and cooperative organizations. So, uh, yeah, we just need to move forward with that idea. And uh, to comment about the game, Global Game Jam next year, we're going to be there with you as well. Not like this year. <laughs> this slight, small hiccup there. Yeah. And um, before questions, I'd just like to ask the general question. Uh, if someone in the audience or watching live on the internet or however, would like to join some of your companies or clubs, how would they do it? Or how can they do it? Can they join your clubs and companies? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Just pay the entrance fee and that's it. Do you accept on the local uh, fellows from, let's say, Kajani, Tampere, Turku, or how do you work? What are the requirements? Uh, hard to say. Of course, uh, requirements are that uh, the guys who want to join our cooperation have to bring some benefit to the cooperation. Not just being a member, they have to work in those productions for the cooperation. I think that's the most important. So, for example, 
our production teams need uh, good uh, game sound designers. So if there's any who wants to join us making sounds for our games, he is very, very welcome. Yeah, we're along those same lines. Uh, SCORE, of course, is open for everyone, not just uh, students at TAMC. It's, of course, sort of a bit easier if you're a student there, but we don't turn anyone away. And we do have several uh, members that are not uh, part of TAMC or not even the same campus. But, uh, of course, the high score is meant for those people who are a bit more serious with it, and they have to sort of want it. So we do have, of course, we have an entrance fee like cooperatives do. But as far as I don't know, we don't turn anyone away. No, that's right. And we have this uh, open house policy, so everybody who's interested in game development can come uh, join with Load. Uh, but uh, we don't have a cur curriculum yet on our uh, like teaching, so you are welcome to uh, join us. So join the Load and uh, develop games. Yeah, and about uh, uh, the requirements, you don't. Uh, you can just contact us, like Yari said, and to take an example. Let's take John. So John contacted me, contacted me, I think, on February or March, something like that. We were here in Finland for two weeks and just like found out this uh, game club from Google, I think, and just hit up an email for me and asked if he could join and, and what's this about, and that's what he did. And now John's here teaching us how to do art. So that's it. That's great. So now we have a few minutes left for any questions you might have. and. I said you, uh, suggest you take them because we actually have here in assembly three CEOs of these companies present and we didn't mention it but there's also one company here in Helsinki, one Osuskunta, who might be interested on more local uh, participants in their activities. They've made some uh, relationships, uh, games with the Mountain Sheep and some other companies. I think I'd have to get an update from them. But do we have any questions now? Well, let's take from here from the start. Please take a mic so others can hear. This is not really so much a question, but more of um, the, the problem I had when I first came here was I had to do a lot of searching, um, <laughs> like Google searching, before I found load. Uh, and it's um, it, it, is there a way? Um, and uh, you kind of addressed it earlier. What what is the best way that we can have like a, this common uh, whatever it is portal or something? Where would somebody go other than searching through Google links to, that they could say, "Hey, I'm here. Who do I get in touch with? Who can I talk to? Is there someone that is the in charge of everything that that can give people, for example, if, if you don't speak fluent English, I mean uh, Finnish, like myself, that they could turn to without, you know, is is something like that in place? And if not, when will it be? And how can we get that information? And how can we get that out to those people? So. Okay, this is something uh, we panelists have discussed a lot, and I think I can give a short answer myself quite easily. Uh, basically, this is something we call osaamisverkosto ourselves, so something like a knowledge network. And we are currently discussing the portal you mentioned because we know there's, there's no single point of contact right now, and we want one. But the problem is, of course, that uh, when no, no one's really in charge of anything, how can we do it uh, in a way that we can at least have you know, a one mail address, one forum, one blog or something to really gather all the feeds. We're working on it and I hope that's something that we can really get done in the next year. Or they can, I'm leaving. <laughs> but anyhow, so what a great comment. That's something that's coming. And yeah, we have one more question there in the middle, if you can run the mic. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, has any of these companies or students thought of making games for uh, platforms like a uh, source engine and so on, so they would 
get actually ready tools for working and how they intend to release them if they get done? Uh, just to clarify, are you talking about mods or? Yeah, I mean uh, mods uh, like uh, Counter Strike was first yeah. a modification which was free and now it's a uh, actually game you can purchase from internet and so on because that I think that would bring a really easy way to distribute those games. That's a great question. Uh, if you ta start with that. <coughs> yes, uh, actually our students have been talking about making games uh, using Source Engine or Unreal Engine, but uh, we have uh, uh, thought that uh, Unity is a quite quite a good engine to make games for PC, but also the uh, mobile devices are very uh, important platform to us. So uh, normally the PC games, they are very, very big tasks to make. So we have started with smaller games and uh, in the future, when our students have more experience and more, more time to do bigger uh, productions, I think there will be some games coming for using Unreal or Source Engine. Yeah, I agree that modding is also a great way to show that you are into games and you can make them. But it's, of course, up to the students whether they want to make them. We don't force anyone, like, you have to make a mod now, otherwise we don't take you. So it's really up to the students what they want to make. We have a few Unreal development kits, and I think people have worked on them. I don't know any particular project at the moment. But it's, it's really what the students want to do, and at the moment it's sort of more into Flash and Unity and XNA. But why not? The tools are there, and if something is missing and we can get it, we'll get them for it. Uh, we'll get it for them. Uh, to address the Counter Strike thing, the Counter Strike was a like a dynamic thing that uh, involved or evolved in a period of a long time. So that's like a one in a million thing. But uh, uh, making mods, of course. U using UDK is maybe one point now because it's free to use until with some license, of course. Uh, yeah, of course you can use those tools. The main tool for us is Unity because of the ease of use. So it's ma basically a similar tool as you discussed. If you haven't heard about Unity, but then where? Well, you're using those. There's a question there. Uh, I think we are actually running short on time, but if it's a fast one, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, add to that. UDK question that uh, I myself uh, am a student at TAMC, Tampere University of Applied Sciences, and um, we, what we encountered with UDK with one project was that uh, um, it took so long to actually learn the damn thing, whereas Unity we could just have one long weekend or a whole week and we were ready to start prototyping and doing stuff, but yeah. A team in Turku had similar problems. You know, the course that lasted uh, seven weeks. The main things were like battling the Unreal script and the interface. How to make things happen? How you could make a third-person character move the way that it doesn't look all wonky? Yeah, and a lot of the problems. We also had w was the fact that uh, if we wanted to know something like, okay, how how do I exp import the animation, these character animations, or this character here, or how or whatever I do, uh, we just basically had to search, you know, tutorials and stuff like that. That and the problem there is that even though internet tutorials usually are very good but there weren't that many you know and yeah so i think our time's pretty much up and i know we're happy to continue this uh the discussion and please know that we had a few games up from the schools on the game development competition the seven bit pirates and the uh, funkenstein funkenstein sorry so, if you're interested in those, want to know how they were made, wanna, you know, if you want to steal the source code or anything, just come by our booth and try, and you might even succeed. So, bring us up your challenge, and thank you for coming. <laughs>